Um, okay, great. So <clears throat> I was asked to uh, spend about 10 minutes to go over this last section of the talk from uh, this morning. And so just to re uh, recap, I started off by talking about the anatomy of critical layers. We talked about the anatomical reference data based on kind of quantitative T1 uh, based on the API readout. I talked about pre-processing, again, mostly looking to avoid inadvertent you know, losses in resolution due to analysis steps. We talked a little bit about how to generate uh, laminar profiles. We talked about the difference between cortical depths and cortical layers and how uh, this varies between uh, uh, across the folds as well as across different cortical areas. <clears throat> so the last topic, I think no talk on this topic of laminar from rise will be complete without a little bit of a discussion on the cortical depth dependence of the hemodynamic response. <clears throat> so I'll just spend 10 minutes on this topic. I'm sure that you'll be hearing a lot more about this uh, throughout the <clears throat> throughout the uh, workshop, but I think it's good to, again, to just define the problem that we're facing and get some sense for, you know, what the solutions may be. And so again, um, just going back to this, this corrosion cast that I showed you before, just to kind of highlight again the different scales of vascular anatomy. In order to interpret our fMRI signals, we need to take into account how the vasculature and the hemodynamics they vary across cortical depths and they both vary systematically. I think this is really nicely demonstrated by recent work from Anna DeVore's group in which she showed that the bulb response amplitude and shape vary systematically across cortical depths. So this is from uh, mouse cortex. So you look at the ROIs on, on the left here, if you look at the sort of ROI in red at the top of the peel, the peel surface, and the corresponding bulb response trace on the right, you see that the red trace has a very high amplitude. It also has a very pronounced post-stimulus undershoot, as well as it looks like a small initial dip immediately following the neural activity. If you compare this time course uh, with the time course from the black ROI, which you can see is sampling from the parenchyma, the corresponding black curve on the right has no post under undershoot, you know, much smaller uh, initial dip, as well as a smaller amplitude overall. So what you can see is that um, the, both the amplitude and shape vary. It's been posited that this is due to not only different vascular contributions across cortical depth, but also due to the facial gradient of microvascular and dilation delays as a function of cortical depth or more to the point uh, as a function of the branching order of the vasculature. <clears throat> so what this means is that in fMRI analysis, especially a task-based analysis, if we use a single canonical or any HRF across all, you know, to analyze data across all cortical depths, there's likely to be a detection bias. You're more likely to see activation at the depth where the hemodynamic response matches your model. Uh, none of these really resemble the canonical nature of course, but this is more relevant for kind of longer block designs. I'm sorry, other way around. It's more relevant for short event-related paradigms. Maybe this is what you're going to ask, Renzo. You know, when the timing is really important, whereas for a long, prolonged block design uh, experiments, this is less of uh, an issue. Yeah. So, um, just to be very specific, you were saying that the shape here is all vascular driven. It's not neural. That one. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, so the question is, you know, to what extent can we attribute differences in the HRF shape across depths to some sort of neuronal difference across the depths? And I, I would say that, you know, clearly it's not known. I think that in this example, they tried to use a columnar type experiment in which all neurons across the cortical layers were being activated. It seems that what this study also did in, you know, um, I believe in the same cortical regions, they used two photon microscopy to observe the dilation delays. And what they saw was that, as is well known, the dilation occurs originally early, close to the neural activity, kind of spreads outwards, both um, anterograde and retrograde, both upstream and downstream. And it seems that the patterns that they're seeing here can be explained in terms of you know, these vascular delays. Now, let's, you know, it seems the most likely explanation. Uh, not clear that you know they haven't they weren't able to measure the neural activity across all the depths and so that's again I think a likely interpretation but you know it's not 100 percent validated you know because again this is consistent with the kind of timing differences of di dilation delays it seems most likely to be a vascular artifact. Um, <clears throat> but as I said yeah the point again is that you know whatever HRF you use you know, what it means is that you're very likely to be using the wrong HRF for at least you know, one cortical depth, and this needs to be taken into account. Uh, this was from the mouse cortex. This was actually Natalia's just walking in now. So Natalia's group, 
uh, looked at this uh, same feature in the human uh, visual cortex able to reproduce these findings of varying HRL features across cortical depth, including both amplitude and shape. Seeing how uh, the trial response as well as the deconvolved estimate of the impulse response vary systematically across depth, again, reproducing uh, an apparent initial dip seen from ROIs measuring at uh, the peel surface. So again, what this tells us is that both in humans and of course in, uh, in, in mice as well, uh, any HRF model is only going to be appropriate potentially for one at a time. So one might try to estimate a kind of depth specific hemodynamic response function. Uh, this is notoriously difficult. We also know is that the hemodynamic response you know, varies with uh, stimulus timing, it varies depending on the population of neurons one is stimulating. And so I think that actually estimating a kind of depth dependent ref to use in these BLM analyses, I'm not really sure how to do that. You know, and again, we're getting closer and closer to, uh, you know, the neural activity here. We have to be mindful of the fact that different types of stimuli are likely to elicit different hemodynamic responses. It's really the last, you know, point that I want to make here, and perhaps, you know, the most important is, um, you know, even if, and this is a big if, I haven't talked about this much at all. I mean, this is a whole other lecture. Even if blood flow is regulated finely enough to support layer-specific responses, it seems to be possible in certain cortical or certain brain regions, maybe not in all. Even, even if this is the case, you know, we have to contend with um, these uh, downstream hemodynamic effects that we see due to the asymmetries and how the cortex is fast in the We know um, for the bolt signal, for example, we know that the deoxygenated blood is drained upwards out to the surface as the blood exits the brain. What this means is that there can be an accumulation of volt signal across different cortical depths. So say, for example, if we expect a neural activity in, say, layer 6, we'd expect to see a local uh, volt response within layer 6. But the problem is that because this, you know, deoxygenated blood is being drained upwards of the brain, we're also going to see a volt response in, say, layer 4, even though there's no neural activity locally in layer 4. Complicating matters even more. So, say there's also activity in, in layer top of layer four. We're going to see in the layers two, three, an accumulation of bolt signals. So you can see that just looking at where uh, the activity is localized doesn't really tell us you know, which layers are being activated, where the neural activity is occurring. And so the Donders group has tried to kind of model this accumulation of the bolt signal across critical depths, and they proposed these nice a laminar spread functions to try to capture the expected bolt response that you would see if any one layer were activated normally. Note that these laminar spread functions are nice and asymmetric to convey the fact that, again, in the bolt signal, there is this asymmetry. We do see uh, bold signals in layers above those that are intact. Um, so I will also say that, you know, you know um, uh, that uh, given the, you know, the um, intricate, interconnected, intercortical vasculature, uh, we expect to see similar kind of effects, uh, a coupling of activation within the cortex across layers, and other sort of non-bold signals as well. We know that for techniques that are more arterial-weighted, we may also see upstream hemodynamic effects that can cause integration or can cause some coupling of signals across layers. So this is a problem that's not only specific to bold. And that is where I wanted to end. Um, I could always show a little bit more, but I think these are capturing kind of the main points that I wanted to convey. Depth dependent HRF is a coupling of the signal across depths, which is a big confound in terms of interpreting these data. I know that people have tried to deconvolve these kind of laminar spread functions. Uh, the problem, of course, there is that, you know, we're not completely alone at this point. I bet they're going to be varying depending on whether you're close to uh, a diving, uh, or I should say ascending venule or not. We know that there's uh, differences because not all ascending venules reach layers. So it's a pretty complicated uh, system and therefore very challenging uh, to invert. But the point is to be mindful of the fact that you may be, if you're just trying to infer which layer is being activated by localizing the bold activity, uh, that might not be possible. Okay, so that's, that's all I wanted to cover. Um, what else did I skip over quickly? Um, any questions? Well, I'm trying to remind myself what I said and didn't say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in bold. In bold. So, right. Um, I mean, even two before that. So I was wondering if we can tweak it. Like, and this mm -hmm. is physiological noise, right? So if we this have is, very high resolution, mm -hmm. it should become more flat, right? And even if we have 
if you have larger flip angles for the TRs, it might even be inverted. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we modulate the influence of the physiological noise in the data. Right. Mm -hmm. so it might, could be that just looking at the statistical difference of a certain layer mm -hmm. in one sequence setup, you might get it oh, in the superficial yeah. one, in another sequence setup, you might get it in the. Yeah, that's a very important point. Yeah, the space, the, the depth dependence of the noise. Yeah, it's also going to be very sequence specific. And, you, you know, I mean, this, at least uh, the depth dependent noise gets factored into, for example, you know, your, your Z statistic. Um, and so some of that is sort of captured when you do statistical inference. What's not captured, I think, today is the fact that uh, not only do we see that the contribution of physiological noise varies, but because of this, you know, the temporal autocorrelation in the data is also likely to vary. And therefore, the degrees of freedom, you know, well, it may vary as a function of depth. I don't think anybody is taking this into account. I think very rarely do people even take into account temporal autocorrelation when doing these statistics. Yeah, but that's a, that's a very good point. And it's going to depend. I mean, again, this is just one example. You know, as you're saying, as you change the sequence parameters, you know, you may see very different, you know, uh, trends of physiological ones across depths. Of course, this example was meant to highlight the differences between voxel-based and surface-based depth assignment. But yeah, your points are very important. Um, any other questions? Oh, oh sure. I think the, the raw algorithm mm -hmm. the discretion for you is much, much higher in the gray market. But in your case, oh. only little I code should be higher. You know, yeah, the retro I core, I mean, I can pull it up again, but it's like 6% of the variance. You know, pretty small. Mm -hmm. And we compare these to Marta's data, her pie chart. You know, it's because these boxes are small, I don't remember the details of this experiment, like one millimeter isotropic probably. Yeah, I mean, it's true that on the one hand, we're happy to see trends at all because, you know, we're pretty clearly thermal noise dominated in this case. Uh, I think we made this kind of depth dependent pie chart with Marta. <laughs> you know, and it's true that uh, the re retro i core regressor <clears throat> captured 6% of the variance. It was way more than any other, we also had n-tidal CO2. You know, we are seeing that, you know, I think we had an abstract last year uh, also showing that um, in, a, in a similar way that, you know, different forms of physiological noise kind of uh, do impact, you know, across cortical depths in different ways. We see that, for example, cardiac noise is really concentrated on the surface because most of the way that cardiac noise kind of infiltrates the volt signal is through dynamic partial volume effects, kind of like T1 effects. Whereas things that are more kind of based on susceptibility, you know, like the effects of respiration, they do extend down further. Um, the point is, yeah, for these data overall, I was a little bit surprised to see how little variance was being explained. You know, the good news is that there's not a lot of physical, physiological noise. Uh, the you know, bad news is that, yeah, physiological noise is, red. well, I was going to say easy to remove. I mean, or at least we have ways to remove it. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of unexplained variance. Um, and so, um, unless there are any other questions, I flew through this also before these open questions on that needs. I mean, I guess, you know, Cheryl, in, you know, in your introduction, you mentioned that the goal of this workshop was not necessarily to provide solutions or to tell people how they should analyze their data <laughs> they're discussing over lunch, you know, I mean, um, but rather to sort of kind of unearth some of the open problems that we have and kind of figure out, you know, where our efforts should need to be directed in order to make progress. And so I did, uh, put together this, you know, kind of brief list. I mean, all of this stuff I touched upon in my presentation, so none of it's necessarily surprising. Um, but I do think that this represents, um, actually, I even have a longer term. This represents what I think are sort of like short term. Um, you know, to just read it out loud for everybody, you know, we do need specialized analysis tools. It's pretty clear over and over again that existing tools really aren't appropriate for this data. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, one big issue that we're facing is estimating positions of cortical layers. Uh, these really vary a lot of folding patterns. They shift between brain areas, brain regions. You know, more characterization of vascular bias. This is a big one. Uh, we see the ultimate specificity of blood flow regulation is still not known. Um, how do we go forward? You know, we've been working towards trying to model an individual level subject-specific vasculature to try to use the vasculature of that subject. And this is a big one, and, and this isn't something we're going to tackle, you know, but I think I, I do want to emphasize that, you know, we're really at the edge, not only of modern fMRI, right? We're kind of at the edge of kind of conventional neuroscience as well. We're asking questions, you know, it's not like we're just trying to reproduce, you know, findings that people already expect to be there. 
you know, we're looking at things that have no ground truth associated with them. And that's very dangerous, right? Because we have errors in our measurements, we have vascular biases, and we have no idea what the neural patterns of activity should be. So how do we move forward? And that, that's a tough question, which relates to this next slide, I think. Did I see? I mean, it's a hidden slide. Give me one second. Ah, it is a hidden slide. Longer term open questions, <laughs> uh, just to ponder this, you know, and, and I've kind of been harping on this because I think it's important. I'll say it again. Like, what's the ultimate specificity both in space and in time of, of the uh, vascular response in humans? It, it seems like, you know, we're seeing more evidence that measures made from animal models really aren't appropriate. The vasculature is completely different. Uh, <laughs> what acquisition <laughs> do we want to use here? You know, I think that you know, while we're making, I have to say, I think we've taken gradient echo bold as far as we can go. Pretty happy with gradient echo bold. It's got a lot of sensitivity, but we need something more. Uh, the question is, you know, what gives us the, you know, the best sensitivity specificity trade-off? I think we're seeing that techniques based on uh, screen board volume have a lot of potential. Not only do we need techniques that are more neuronally specific, you know, we also need, you know, we need imaging resolution that's sufficient to sample the structures of interest, both in space and in time. You know, how do we push, how do we get voxels that are smaller, right? I mean, we're bending over backwards sometimes with a little bit too much partial Fourier to get you know, sub-millimeter voxels. You know, how do we get smaller voxels? What do we need? Better sequences, faster gradients, denser coils, bigger magnets? I'll put it, <laughs> I think all four is the right answer. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is a lot of effort, you know, we might be, you know, five years out from working to push back to the current kind of paradigm in terms of resolution. Yeah, and how do we account for, you know, varying microvascular and capillary density? It's one thing to be able to use angiographic techniques in order to measure, you know, macroscopic or mesoscopic blood vessels, but we do know that the microvascular density also varies and can introduce you know, a lot of biases. And finally, and I alluded to this, you know, in the last slide, you know, a lot of what we're doing now is still in the stage of being confirmatory. You know, same thing with the columns. We're measuring ocular dominance columns. We know they're there. We're measuring V2 stripes. We know that they're there. And now we're trying to, you know, see patterns of inputs and outputs. We kind of they're there. And, you know, hopefully our patterns agree with what's known. But what happens when we see something that disagrees, you know, with the, you know, with the you know, canonical literature or whatever looking at a region that isn't really well understood? You know, how do we have enough confidence to take our laminar fMRI data and say that, you know, how do we validate? How do we move past these studies looking at things we already know to be there to kind of learn something new? I don't know the answer to that. We'll figure it out together. I erased our schedule. Do you need the lights? But we're gonna, okay. So we're going to go brief if we can and do type one stuff now. That section of the class will end at 2 30. We'll take There'll be coffee set out again, 2.30 to 2.45 over in that building. And then we will all come together as a group again in this room at 2.45. And I'd like to take the first 15 minutes to kind of continue this conversation um, and just and give everybody a voice and surface in what we feel like are the top six things. And, and I want kind of two parts of that conversation, but one is, are there things that we can all agree, metrics we can shoot on our data that, that can give us confidence that like, if I show you some new fMRI result that does not in any way predicted from animal literature or something else we've done, and it's a surprising result, is there a series of things that I can prove to you about my data, steps that I've taken my data through? And I'm like, yeah, I did that, I calculated that, I calculated that, I calculated that. And at this point, you believe me that I did my science right. And so when I show you the surprising new result, we're like, hey, new finding. Or are we still at the point where we're like, well, maybe it's because you processed that way, or you learned that, or you mentioned this or this or that, or you didn't take the absorption. And it feels like as a field, we've gotten to the point where we can 
have a series of benchmarks to can all agree on that we can use to convince each other, no, I did my science right, and this new finding really is a continued finding. So I want to start having that conversation just for 15 minutes, 245 to 3. And, and the three lectures are going to take us through more data all together as one group, kind of. And um, then we're going to wrap the day at 4.30 with um, what John just got done alluding to here. There's the workhorse gradient echo, and then there's this dream of other more spatially selective techniques. Why aren't we doing them? I can tell you why I'm not currently doing them. But we'll talk about more, more fancy stuff like at the end of the day. And then I started writing tomorrow's schedule out. I'm not quite done, but that'll at least get you through the morning. Um, OK. So if you haven't been to a scanner, now's the time to go. Oh, and just to let people who weren't in the room know, the computers are the computers. And so getting moving before lunch took us a while. So Tim could only get through half of what he wanted to talk about, the boundary-based registration part. And so there's a second um, spatial regression layerification part. And so instead of doing repetitive sections, Tim's just going to we're going to first get everybody onto the server again, and then pick up kind of the stuff that Tim wanted to finish this morning. So the, the before and after pipeline sessions of this room are not going to be perfect matches, but before I go to bed tonight, I will clean up all of the recordings and post things. So at the end of the day, it'll look like we did a great tree and all. Um, but all right, break again if you want. And if you're going to stay in this room, get out your computer and try logging onto that lesson server. Thank mm -hmm. you.